Good morning and welcome as we gather on this, the second Sunday in the seven-week season that is Easter, a season that the church gives us in order to reflect on the implications of the resurrection, to be reminded that it's not just a one-off, one one-time event, but a living reality, and to consider the fact that Jesus is not a theological proposition, but someone who is alive and desires uh, to relate and be in relationship uh, to us and with us. So welcome as we come to do all that in the next uh, hour or so, and uh, to focus our hearts on the living God and what he has in store for us in the week ahead. Craig will lead us in a responsive reading of Psalm 16, and then David will lead us in song. So please stand and let us begin our worship together. Please join me in the psalm of approach. Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Good morning to all. Let us join together in songs of praise. I hope you have felt Easter resurrection and joy this week. We're gonna continue that with these particular songs and hymns. We'll begin with Jesus, name above all names, and then we'll mix, crown him with many crowns, with with um, rejoice the Lord is King and at the very end of the last verse of crown him with many crowns I've added just this little tag the Lord is King so I'd like you to sing that with me now <laughs> the, the Lord, Lord is King. King lovely let's do it together and that's how we'll end that time Let's sing together. Jesus, name above all names, beautiful Savior, glorious Lord, Emmanuel, God is with us, blessed be
was in the strife for those he came to save. His glories now we sing, who died and rose on high, who died eternal life to bring, and lives at death may die. Rejoice! Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Rejoice, give thanks and sing, and triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again. Join me, please, uh, in our prayer of approach, praying together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have delivered us from the dominion of sin and death and brought us into the kingdom of your beloved Son. As we gather in the fellowship of his body, fill us with your peace as we rejoice, give thanks, and sing through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the It was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn to your neighbor and pass the peace. And as you're doing so, children, if you want to meet Mrs. Webb up front, she will take you downstairs for Children's Church. Right up front, Gabby. Right there. Have fun. Be nice to Mrs. Webb.
Again, good morning and welcome as we gather together on this uh, season of Easter, in this season of Easter. At least in terms of uh, formal meetings, it's a relatively quiet week. The trustees uh, will be meeting on Wednesday, although that is their uh, meeting to put together the budget for our coming church year. So just please keep them in prayer uh, as they work through that uh, this coming Wednesday. Are there uh, other announcements that we need to share? Then as we turn our hearts uh, to prayer this morning, a number of uh, folks to keep in your prayers in the week ahead. I uh, had a long chat with Price Grisham this past week. He has um, been diagnosed with AFib, as well as a couple of other uh, physical maladies, and uh, is pretty, pretty discouraged and worn down. So please uh, hold him in your prayer as further testing uh, continues. Uh, Dave Shorey came through well. His first cataract uh, surgery last week, and the second one will happen in another couple of weeks, so pray that he will be able to see the music in a balanced way uh, fairly soon. Uh, we pray for the Brown family. Uh, Steve uh, unexpectedly lost his job this past week uh, teaching at uh, furniture making at the North Bennett Street School. So just keep him and Peggy in your prayers as they uh, ask what is next uh, ahead for them. Uh, Debbie Pike's mother, Susan, uh, was, uh, is in the hospital at Leahy Burlington, having suffered a stroke this past week. Uh, Debbie lost her father just six weeks ago, so uh, she is really up against it and uh, uh, needs uh, our prayers for God's sustaining grace with her and, and healing for her mom. And then uh, our hearts go out to Roger Tyler this morning, whose father, Bill, uh, passed away this past uh, week at the age of 96, Raj? Is that what you 95. 95. And uh, uh, Bill left his stamp uh, on many people, uh, including this church. So pray for the Tyler family as they mourn his passing and, and celebrate his life. So let us bring these and other concerns uh, or celebrations to the throne of grace uh, as we join together in prayer this morning. Well, fathers, we have... Uh, sung already there are so many ways that we can address you so many ways we can reflect on who you are beautiful savior glorious lord blessed redeemer living word lamb upon the throne king over all and maybe most amazingly, God with us. In a way, we've seen this past week that not even death can take away or destroy. So Lord, help us as a community and as people to continue to rejoice and to give thanks and to sing for all that this season and event of resurrection brings to us. Be with us as well, Lord, when at the same time we recognize in our lives that all is not victory. That we don't live our lives on the tops of mountains, but often in the valley of the shadows. That suffering has not left us as quickly as we would like it to. That there's chronic pain that we suffer, that there are bodies that betray us, that there are circumstances that just don't seem to be changing. Lord, remind us at those times that your love and your power has been displayed in weakness on a cross. And so may that grace be sufficient for us in these times when we walk and wonder. Help us to rest in your love and your grace and the comfort and the power of your spirit and the fellowship of your people. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for our various needs as uh, just outlined for Price as he battles different maladies, uh, for Dave as he anticipates another round of surgery. For Steve, as he looks out to what his future may hold. To Debbie, as she cares for her mother, Susan. 
and for Roger and his family as they mourn the loss uh, of his dad, Bill, and others who mourn that loss as well. Lord, may your spirit of power and comfort and grace and healing be with each of these uh, individuals and those who are uh, caring for them. Lord, in your mercy. To these concerns, we ask uh, of you, Father, either silently or uh, aloud others that are on our hearts uh, this day at this moment. Hear our prayer. Pray for Rama's older brother, Jamie, who's suffering the effects of a concussion and needed to be hospitalized this past week. Um, thank you that the um, bleeding in his brain has stopped, and we pray for full recovery uh, for him. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And we continue to pray, Father, for the vaccination process, the distribution uh, of that shot, and the effective, um, effectiveness of it. And um, Lord, we pray that um, our nation would take advantage um, of the ability to, uh, to stave off uh, this virus through the vaccine. Lord, in your mercy. Now we join our voices together, celebrate the family into which Jesus has called us by praying the prayer that he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs> the word this morning consists of three readings. The first reading from the Gospel of John pictures the followers of Jesus on the evening of the first day of resurrection, hiding in fear behind locked doors. The second reading from the book of Acts gives us a picture of the early church in Jerusalem living in an incredibly vibrant way. And then our third reading from John's first letter begins a, a letter of encouragement and exhortation to members of the church not to fall away from the fellowship that they've been uh, exposed to in the person of Jesus, as well as uh, the fellowship that they are enjoying uh, as a gathered body. So Craig will read each of those passages for us, and then we will uh, pull them together 
uh, this morning. The Gospel reading from John chapter 20. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And then from the book of Acts, all the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. And then from 1 John, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our ears, with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. May God bless the reading and the hearing of his word, and let's take a few moments of silent reflection. Amen. I think it's helpful to recognize that on that first Easter Sunday, the primary emotion of the followers of Jesus was not sort of the primary emotion that we may come to Easter Sunday with. They were not necessarily filled with joy. In fact, we read that they were bewildered. They were confused. They were afraid. So much so that by the end of the day, the followers of Jesus had locked themselves inside of a room. I would imagine that there were a number of questions swirling through their minds that perhaps led to this action. Maybe first and foremost was wondering whether the, the Jewish religious leaders and the Roman authorities would again join forces and just like they had wiped out their leader Jesus, now come after his followers in a kind of mopping up operation. As well, they might have been afraid of what their friends and relatives would say to them, how they might even ridicule them for backing seemingly the wrong horse, a Messiah that wound up just getting himself crucified. Also going through their minds might have been the words of the women from their group that actually this Jesus was alive. Well, if that was the case, what on earth would be his reaction to them? who would all abandon them at his time of need. And how could you explain an empty tomb anyway? Before we push on, it might just be worth thinking about, are there ways that we hide? Are there walls that we sort of try to sneak behind? Are there ways in which we lock the doors of our hearts to what Jesus may want to do in us and through us? 
Are there heavy burdens of guilt, sort of must-have-beens or should-have-beens that we carry with us? Instead of responding to the invitation that Jesus wants to make us resurrection people. Are there ways in which we're afraid of what Jesus might say to us or what he might call us to do or to be? There are lots of ways, I think, either intentionally or maybe subliminally, that we erect walls and, and, and try to sort of separate ourselves from the activity of God in our lives. But whether it's out of bewilderment or confusion or fear, the good news is Jesus won't keep us there. That Jesus has the ability to break through any walls that we erect, no matter how high or how thick, or any lock that we might construct, no matter how stout. And as we see in this picture, Jesus breaks through all of those. And he's right there in their midst. In the midst of their fear, in the midst of their confusion, in the midst of their bewilderness, or bewilderment. There he stands. And the issue doesn't really seem to be how in the world did he get in here. The issue becomes how did he respond? What did he do once he landed there in their midst? And what he did marvelously was bring them his grace, his undeserved favor. First thing he said, peace be with you. Shalom, well-being, may it be well with your soul. He didn't chew them out as, as, as chumps who had abandoned him or mo move into that, I told you so, tempting kind of a place. But no, I am here, all is well, you should be well. And then he goes on to commission them for his purposes. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. What a head-spinning, remarkable turn of events in just a couple of minutes. From fear to fellowship with the risen Lord. And the beginning, really, of fellowship with his people. If you think just about these few verses, they can tell us some pretty significant things about what our faith is all about. Our faith is not the projection of our longings. Our faith is, is not the, some intellectual insight that we might have. Our, our faith is not made up of our wishes and desires. Our faith is based on an outstanding act of God, the act of resurrection, which changes everything, which brings us into fellowship with the living God and then turns us outward into fellowship with his people. It's the picture we see emerge in Acts, actually. As the gift of the Spirit comes and the followers of Jesus begin to proclaim the resurrection, the church takes root. And it's a remarkable fellowship of people. Fellowship here meaning not folks who, who are sort of like one another and get together because they like to do the same activity, like uh, a, a sewing circle or a book club or folks who get together to play video games. The church actually is made up of a whole bunch of people who are really unlike each other and are only gathering because they've been touched and met by a Savior who is unlike any other. What else explains this early church proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead when they were at the same time being persecuted for that pro proclamation? What would move this group of people to begin to sell property and use the proceeds to meet the needy among them? What else really but the resurrection? In fact, when you look at the best evidence for the resurrection, it's not really the empty tomb, as significant as that is. It's a full and vibrant community that is seeking to love others as Jesus has loved them. It's really the only way you could explain the church coming into existence, given where the followers of Jesus began in fear behind locked doors on the evening of the resurrection. 
the church was formed because of that resurrection event of Jesus and the proclamation of it by his followers. Well, that brings us then to 1 John, written towards the end of the first century, several decades after that church in Jerusalem that we read about in Acts had been formed. John, most likely, was the writer of the gospel that bears his name. He was one of the 12 apostles. He was a leader of the church in Jerusalem. But when the Romans came and, and leveled, leveled or overran the holy city in 70 AD, John, with a number of other followers of Jesus, had to flee, had to leave. And he settled in the city of Ephesus, where he spent really kind of his retirement years, if you will, being a pastor to other local pastors of churches in that area. And the letter he wrote here is a letter of encouragement and exhortation. Because it seemed there were those who had begun to fall away from this beautiful Savior and this incredible fellowship that had begun to emerge following his resurrection. A little bit later in the letter, John will say that there were those who went out from us who are trying to lead you astray. There were splinter groups that had begun to form, it seems, that were holding different views about who Jesus is and different views about how Jesus had called his people to live. Christology and ethics, kind of the two, two big issues that were, were uh, up for discussion. And frankly, it broke this pastor's heart to see people wandering away, not necessarily from the church, although that's hard enough, but wandering away from the faith. And so John penned this letter. As he says, he wrote it to make his joy complete. And I think there are a couple levels to that joy. One is he wanted people to know the life that was available in this person, Jesus. It's like when you receive good news. Uh, you don't just sit on it, do you? You have to share it. You go down the street and tell a friend, you pick up the phone, you send a text or a tweet. The news is actually incomplete until it's shared, and then it's complete in some way. And so, yes, John wanted those who didn't know Jesus to come to know him, but John also wanted to protect the fellowship that had already been formed. He wanted to encourage those who were a part of that fellowship to stand fast and not fall away. And so he began right up front with where it all begins in the Christian life, with, with Jesus. And he talked about the fact that he was part of those first eyewitnesses who saw Jesus, who heard Jesus, who touched Jesus, who walked with Jesus the entire uh, three years of his ministry, who heard what he had to say, who saw the miracles he did. Who experienced not only the cross, but then the incredulity of the resurrection. And who began to proclaim it. John had witnessed the historical and the physical presence of this Jesus, the Son of God. And he wanted to share that with these folks. To help them feel secure and sure in their faith. One of the things he refers to Jesus as the word of life. It's a word that should remind us of another word that John penned at the beginning of his gospel. He calls Jesus there the word made flesh. And this is how it begins. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. There's no mistaking this, said John. We were eyewitnesses to that fact. This is the Son of God who walked among us. He was no sort of eerie spiritual being. He was a physical, living, breathing person. And he came 
to reveal, to bring the life that is truly life. He is the word of life. And so if you allow yourself to be led away from that, you are walking away from the life that God holds out for you. John wants his readers in really every generation to know. And so if we go back to uh, a line from our Psalm of Approach this morning, Psalm 16, a line that says of the Lord, you make known to me the path of life. God has come in his Son to now personally make that path even more clear. To lay out what it means to love one another and then to call us to do the same. He is the word of life, the revealer, the one who speaks what real life is all about. As we read through this first letter of John in the coming weeks, we'll, we'll see signs that he gives us along the way to help us make sure that we're on the right path, the path that Jesus is on, the path that Jesus wants to lead us down. For now, just as he begins, John wants us to be certain that we're listening to, that we're reading someone who knows what he's talking about. Because he was there and saw this embodied God right before his very eyes, walked with him, talked with him, ate with him, observed him, cried with him, laughed with him, was forgiven by him. So may this word to us be both an encouragement and an exhortation as we think about what it means as individuals and as a community to live as resurrection people, as people who are called to enjoy fellowship with the living God and fellowship with his people. Amen. So let us continue to celebrate the day of resurrection as uh, Vicki leads us in our closing hymn, please stand and we will sing together. <clears throat>
Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. To him be glory in Christ Jesus and in the church throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen.